So yeah, I am the Chief Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, which is the longest job title I've ever had. <laughs> Barely fits on a business card. Um, I do that four days a week. And on my fifth day week, I work on the architecture of the web uh, with the W3C, where I serve on the technical architecture group. So we are the technical oversight board that um, helps every working group uh, flesh out their ideas for what web standards they want to work on, helps them plug into other working groups that are doing similar things or where they should be uh, joining up a bit more, looks at the entirety of, of all of the standards work for new ways that the web should work uh, and identifies holes or problems, um, publishes guidance for stuff that we find ourselves saying on a regular basis. So um, I edited with my colleague Dan Appelquist two weeks ago uh, a document on the um, ethics that underpin a lot of the, the web work which includes things like the web needs to be for everyone, so you can't just create a, a web standard that cuts out people who need accessibility technologies if they have disabilities, or that only really work in one language or one culture, um, uh, a whole bunch of other things like that. Um, I think we'll, we'll go on to yeah. more of the, the details as we go, but uh, yeah, a lot of what I'm doing, actually, it sounds vastly different in the two different parts of my brain, but it's seriously overlapping, because it's both about designing a complex system with lots of other people and um, about making stuff work that um, ultimately lots of different people will be feeding in in different ways rather than this being one sort of decision from a small group. Yeah, yeah. And I, there's a really cool, we, we could learn, nerd out and just talk about standards for the entire we time. And we might do that. <laughs> we started but... that earlier. <laughs> so I, um, so I'm a research fellow here at the Turing, which means that I have a five-year research fellowship to, you know, just like do brilliant data science. Um, my PhD was in neuroscience, and I sort of joke that what I would love to do is just think about teenage brain development and why teenagers are at particular risk of mental health disorders. That's what my PhD and my postdoc were working in, and I think it's a really fascinating area. But... I don't trust most of the published papers in the academic literature. And so the link actually to the work that you're doing on open web standards is that one of my many hats is that I work to try and build the brain imaging data structure, which on the surface is just name your files in a particular way. Just if you get this one particular type of file that everyone gets through a structural MRI scan, just call it something that looks like this. And if you get a functional one, which is something that you might do if you were like tapping a button whilst you were kind of, or answering other types of questions whilst you're lying in the scanner, just label it this way. And oh my goodness, holy moly, <laughs> people have really strong opinions about how they name their files. And there's a lot of, I do a lot of work, we're going to talk about this a little bit more about sort of helping the humans come together and getting over their particular deep, deep desire to name these files in a particular way and recognizing that if we all shared our data in the exact same format, if, we, if I named my files in the exact same way that you named your files, what amazing opportunities you could do for new and interesting science if you had access to all of those different, different types of, of data and the sort of metadata that goes along with it. Definitely. And it makes it so much easier when you're the third person trying to use data from two other people Yeah, to know it's going to look the same. So we were talking a little bit about um, the NHS and so the, the history of the NHS and how it sort of has like these different different regions. Do you want to maybe talk everyone through sure. the, this, this slightly bumpy journey that our National Health Service has taken? Right. So the, the very, very big picture potted journey is that in the 1940s, as most of us know, the NHS was created largely by looking at a map and carving up areas of the country and taking a big pot of money from Treasury and chopping it into equivalent pieces and saying, right, you, this lot, have some money. Your job is now to look after the health of these people. Off you go. And then same for you and same for you. And um, that made a whole lot of sense when we couldn't communicate in real time and we couldn't um, share information en masse and all the things that we have now. Um, so fast forward, that was the third, the, the 40s rather, fast forward to the 80s and 90s and uh, various kinds of technology come along and various parts of the NHS said, yeah, we should do that, we should have that. And they made their own decisions about what that should be, much of which was swapping um, filing cabinets for databases, so not necessarily changing the processes, but having a more robust 
storage mechanism and search mechanism for records and the like. Um, and then along comes probably around 15 years ago, maybe a little more, uh, the National Program for IT, when the, the central NHS uh, and the government said, you know, this is a really good thing, these electronic medical records, we should make sure that everyone has one, and actually we should probably do one for the whole country, because we know that it's done really well. And uh, that did not work very well. Um, one of the many reasons is because uh, that project started with the data model first, and then um, a number of the, the people working on the project went to various doctors and said, right, this is the way that the world is going to work. You're going to have to learn all these codes. You're going to have to change the way that you practice medicine according to these systems. And the doctors not unreasonably said, bugger off. We're, we have lives on the line here. And what you're saying doesn't actually make sense for the way to, to keep everybody uh, safe and healthy. Um, so the program ended up largely failing. We have some interesting bits of infrastructure that survived from it. but. Um, so yeah, the central will do it all from one point approach clearly isn't going to work. Um, the, the reactionary response to that from the center was, right, we're, we're not going to have anything to do with this. <laughs> Go off and do whatever you want. Uh, the bits that we will help with is largely funding and some very big picture sort of best practice sharing, but you're on your own. Um, and that has led us to an environment where uh, most parts of the NHS have large uh, electronic patient record systems and, and the like, but most of them are full stack contracts with absolutely no interoperability built into them, um, which means that each hospital sort of operates on its own unless they happen to have the same supplier as another one. That's where the interoperability does come into play. So bottom line, it's, um, it's really hard to get up to date technology into the NHS, particularly uh, digital and, and um, networked stuff. Um, so one of the reasons that we've created NHSX is to guide that transformation. So I just like wave at me if you know what interoperability means. OK, so you guys, yeah, you've been to a lot of these things. You know about these, these different sort of like pulling things together to be able to fit so that you can transfer information. And a lot of what I'm interested in at the Turing Institute is making uh, data and software fair, which is, you probably also know this acronym, so sorry for saying it again, but findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So making sure that taxpayer-funded resources can be, if we just stick with the arch, can be reused by others. And so one of my many ways in which I like to destroy toxic research culture or attempt <laughs> to destroy toxic research culture is focusing on the incentive structure in academia, which at the moment specifically incentivizes people to be unique. So most of the time, if you're applying for a grant in, uh, from one of the research institutes or from a charity um, and you want to do a, a new piece of research, you will usually have to say why you are the best person to do this and how you are better than everybody else. And what that means is that we're swimming. I said earlier that I don't trust most of the academic research. What the reason for that is that people are behaving entirely rationally in a system that says, don't let anybody else know what you're doing. Make it r sound really clever and really complicated and make sure that you tell them just enough that they say, ooh, yeah, that is cool, man. But nowhere near enough for them to be able to do it themselves. And I think, so that's the sort of, that's the R of fair. And what drives me, it makes me want to set myself on fire on a regular Ouch. basis, is that taxpayers are putting money into a system that is then wasting all of their own money keeping the information from them. So, yeah, I, I, I will stop on my, like, make everything fair rant. But the interoperable one is a super interesting aspect because the interoperable one is actually, that's less to do with incentives. That's more to do with knowing that there are standards or making sure that there are standards that exist. Can I ask you about... Um, you were, a you were a, not a research engineer, sorry, a software engineer in mm -hmm. the NHS. Mm -hmm. And what were your frustrations when you were working with the junior doctors there? 
Well, as you brought up earlier when we were talking, so much of it's not the technology, it's the people. Um, and uh, the people were amazing. It was so much fun to do user research and so much fun to talk to people who, uh, who spend their lives working in complex systems. The body is a complex system. And they're very good at understanding that if you change something you know, in this part of the body, then it's going to break or change something over here. And, um, and a lot of them, I found, also thought about the NHS in the same way, which, which helped me understand that there was this massive opportunity for making things better. But speaking as a software engineer, um, I was working with, the, with junior doctors from the, the London Deanery in just London. And we were um, building a digital service to help them get basic information as they rotated from hospital to hospital, which it turned out was a huge problem because as soon as they arrived on the ground, they were so busy treating patients, it would take a while to work out where the training sessions were and who in HR should be their main contact and boring stuff compared to saving lives. But eventually, it turns out to be important. Um, so we're designing a system to, to make sense of all this for them. And uh, I was trying to, to write something, to build something that would work in every hospital and GP surgery in the southeast. And having spent enough time working on the internet and the web, I knew that this should be relatively simple. You should be able to, to write something in the browser that can then run on just about any device. Um, but this was uh, 12 years ago, and the NHS was in a place where that was just impossible. Um, those computers that have web browsers on them had IE6, which is already well out of date at that point. Um, but they were also then caught within the M3 private network, which meant they couldn't really get anything from outside that. And it didn't make sense to be writing something that was just basically scheduling and names and stuff to go into M3. And um, so I went back to all of the junior, doc junior doctors that I was doing user research with and said, look, how, how likely are you to actually use this on the wards? And they laughed and said, not at all. We're going to be very busy. We want to be able to use it on our phones or in um, computers at home or, or in residences. Don't worry about actually getting it into the NHS proper. So that's what we did. We put it in the browser. But I finished that project thinking, we're missing such a massive opportunity. This is amazing potential for the NHS to be able to use web technologies like everybody else does. And then you're talking about research. When you go to do research and you need data from across the NHS, you're basically looking at a, a similar kind of infrastructure problem where the same kinds of APIs and uh, transport protocols and everything else that makes up the internet would make a lot of that research, gathering data for research, much easier. Um, and certainly would then make the case for sorting out a lot of the policy and organizational decision-making stuff that's, that's getting in your way. Um, similarly, as a patient, if I hurt my arm when I'm on holiday and uh, go through x-rays and whatever else in the hospital there, there's no way for my GP to know that unless I go and tell them because the data doesn't travel through the NHS. And again, the solution to this is make it work like the internet. Um, so that's the crux of what we need to do with the NHS is to make it work like the internet part of which is using the internet and um, web stack as it is, but a lot of it also is then going to be essentially hosting within NHSX the standards making process for what we need for the NHS um, so that we won't be making decisions in a vacuum that don't make sense for a particular researcher or a particular startup or software company or um, a particular part of the NHS that wants to run things in whatever way makes sense to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's my rant. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Let's just hand the mic back and forth with the individual <laughs> rants for the entire half an hour that we've it got time. Good. It's cathartic. <laughs> so how did you get to, how did you get from being a software engineer to your, wait for it, chief, chief technology advisor to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care? I wrote it down because I can't remember these things. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to learn it too. Um, I finished that in uh, 2009-10 and then did a brief project in the Department of Health, which got me the central government, but um, not for very long. And then the, the coalition uh, election happened. And as part of the digital transformation for central government, which we'll come on to in a second, but I wasn't a part of it at that point, um, the sort of early stirrings of what was going to become GDS prompted central government to cut all contractors. And at that point, I was a contractor for, um, for the Department of Health. And uh, before it was Department of Health and Social Care. <laughs> um, and so as a result, I finished that project, and, and there was no more interesting things to do with the central government. So I went off and, and created a startup. 
um, called LinkedGov, which was a nonprofit open source project to create games out of all of the boring work you have to do to clean data before you can use it. All of the fixing typos and matching this column to the feet to this column in meters and all that stuff. Um, and we were building on government open data, so I had a, a real interest in the, the open data agenda. Um, but was busy with that for quite a while. Um, and got that funded through government's technology strategy board, uh, which then ended up um, putting us in a position to roll that work into creating the Open Data Institute. And once that was done, I went to Mozilla, and we should definitely talk more about Mozilla. I know you've spent their time, time there too. Yeah. Um, and my plan was to uh, stay with Mozilla as they brought me in to try to work out essentially, so Mozilla is the the organization behind the Firefox browser, right? And Firefox is created by 400,000 volunteer developers across the world. It's a, a big open source project. So they were just starting to work out what's the equivalent. We know that a lot of the, the future is going to be defined through government policy. What's the equivalent for kind of crowdsourcing advice for government policy? And how do we handle the international nature of the world versus the fact that the, the web is global, countries have boundaries and all that stuff. So I went in to join them for uh, what I thought was a short period of time, part-time, a couple of days a week, and had some time to kill. Uh, so I ran into Liam Maxwell, who was then government chief technology officer and just getting started in GDS, government digital service, and said, I've got some time. I obviously can't sit still. Can I do anything useful for you in that time? Uh, so I started working with them for a bit, and I thought at the end of the six-month period, I'll probably go much further into Mozilla and look at things on a global scale and stay closer to engineering um, than uh, stay in, in central government. And halfway through that period, Snowden happened. And I knew from um, working with both people in government and people in um, the tech industry, and thanks to Mozilla, I was spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley, back in Silicon Valley, that everybody more or less had the same vision of the future. They were all kind of headed in the same direction. They were just using different words and they, they didn't trust each other. And then Snowden happened and the rift was just massive, much bigger. Um, and I thought this is gonna be a big problem for the world that we know we need to build, which is both constantly innovating on a, an engineering level, but then also uh, with sensible regulation and sensible protection of the individual and all the stuff that governments are good at. And we're gonna have to figure this out together. And if everybody's not talking to each other, we'll never get there. So this is a problem that needs to be solved. And all of the tech industry, all of the, particularly the American tech companies were saying we feel really disenfranchised. We feel powerless. This is all happening in governments. There's nothing we can do. Um, we're stuck. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do anything to try to help this, if I've got one foot in government and one foot in Mozilla, I should probably go further into government to, uh, to try to knit these two communities together. So I left Mozilla and then went further into cabinet office where I ended up being, um, Matt Hancock then ended up became, becoming a um, minister for cabinet office. So he was in charge of the transforming central government technology agenda. Um, and he said he wanted a tech advisor in his office. Uh, so I, along with several other people, interviewed. And when he was um, interviewing me, he asked that horrible interview question of, what do you want to do with your career? Where are you nice. going? Nice. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that. I sort of take my problems one at a time, and this is the problem that's in front of me, and it's interesting, and I hope I can help. But I know I need to get back to the NHS. At some point, we've got a massive opportunity there. We've got to do it. And, uh, and we laughed a little bit at that point. Uh, Jeremy Hunt was um, in the middle of the junior doctor's strike, and we had our hands full with transforming central government, and, and health was very much its own world at that point. Um, so that was that, and we, we carried on with um, uh, all of the central government public services. Um, fast forward, however, three, month, three more years, the referendum happened, and we both left, and then uh, I went off to another startup, and um, he ended up in DCMS, and then the... Um, Reshuffle happened to put him in health, um, and he, he gave me a call and said, you know, we've been talking about this, now's the moment, you want to do health, let's, let's figure out what that means. Amazing. So that's why I'm here, um, and a lot of it comes back to 12 years of giving those rants. <laughs> yeah, it could be so much better. I love that, I love that we, we've both worked, so I haven't worked for Mozilla, 
I had a fellowship with Mozilla. I was an Open Science Fellow a couple of years ago in 2016. I actually got rejected in 2015. So if anyone wants to ask a question about the power of rejection, it was like that rejection was one of the greatest turning points of my whole life because wow. I got like super mad at the academic system. I was quite mad, but I got like super mad after that. But then the next year I was, I was successful and there were, there were four um, science fellows from around the world and we had an onboarding session. It, it's a 10-month fellowship. You get paid. You get paid quite a lot more than you get paid in academia. So it's this like really fab experience. But you stay in your home institution. And the way that I sort of describe the Open Science Fellowships is you're like a depth charge. So you're sort of there. You're embedded. And now, because you have your independent fellowship, you don't have to do what your boss tells you anymore. And you can just spend your time teaching people GitHub and version control and explaining how to like add metadata to your data files and why you should share and all this sort of stuff. But at the very beginning of that year, we had an onboarding week, five days in Toronto, in Mozilla's offices in Toronto. And we came together with, um, I think, 12 open web fellows. Mm. And they, oh my goodness, that was like, like little Kirsty's eyes. They were like, what? Because the Open Science Fellows, we turn up and we're like, open all the things, open lab notebooks, share all of the ideas, share your data, share your code, everything should be open all the time. And the Open Web Fellows are like, the government is watching you, shut it all down, don't let anybody see, no, we can't use WhatsApp, we've got to use Signal. And we had all of these sort of, you know, and I was like, the first day I walked home and I walked home with one of the, one of the Open Science Fellows who I'd only met that day as well, but I was like, have you ever met anyone like them before? I've never met anyone like them before. <laughs> and what's so fabulous about the fellowship program at Mozilla is that people are very specifically selected because they can advocate well. And so while I originally had had this first day thinking like, oh my goodness, there's all these like paranoid people, by the end of the week, by Thursday actually, I... I was completely on board. I was like, the government are watching you. <laughs> they, they do know everything that's going on. And in fact, you know, it, it's sort of, this was in Canada, but there were quite a lot of US um, fellows. But there's also a lot of, there were people doing really fantastic work around um, bias in machine learning and around kind of advocacy for different groups um, who were being sort of specifically targeted. Mm. Um, and that was really where I sort of took my definition of open, which had generally been from a very sort of privileged position of just saying it would be better if people shared, to really sort of pivoting that a little bit more to saying, um, but not everybody can. So let's look at the bigger picture around why there are these inequalities. Why are people behaving the way that they do? Why are people incentivized to maintain structures of power that have already existed and that have existed for many, many years? Um, and that, I think, works really well with what One Health Tech are trying to do because we got a five-minute sign. We're going to we'll do five more minutes. Okay, because um, I want to ask you um, about that. Yeah. Um, so you, you said you then went into to work out why, and, and that sounds like a really fascinating exploration, but what have you found? Just that everybody's behaving ra behaving entirely rationally in a capitalist society. Okay. So, so basically, if what you are trying to do is like optimize for more money, then all of the non-open behaviors make complete sense. Mm. And if you already have power because it is bestowed upon you by being a white person who speaks English as their first language and is quite well educated... I mean, I have like three degrees. I'm like very well educated. Let's just be, let's just be clear. Um, while I do not see the privilege, because that's the definition of privilege, I have much more power in an ecosystem than mm. others do. And so when you look at, for example, um, data science or academia um, on a global scale, and you say, well, some of these weird countries, these, I never remember them, Western, educated... The R is rich, the D is democratic. I've forgotten what the industrialized countries, weird. these are the weird countries. They are doing very well. Maybe it's something to do with what, what, what they've done. But actually, if you go back to history, there's just a lot of sort of biases that have always been there. And now what we're doing in data science and artificial intelligence is potentially operationalizing 
those biases and then being able to point to computer said that it's that this is the way the world is not my problem mm. and so yeah so it's quite it's quite stressful to get up in the morning and feel like all I want people to do really through one lens all I want people to do is give me a way to check that when they say there was a group difference between this patient group and this patient group on a particular treatment with an effect size of two days and a p-value of less than xyz just all I really want is just to be able to check those numbers like that's all I really want but as a result of having these long deep long sort of conversations you actually realize that you have to break down capitalism potentially in order to get there so can you dig into a little further which part of capitalism or how do you see that manifesting so I think the big thing for me is that we don't currently incentivize collaboration so that's mm -hmm. what I was saying about the the R of, of fair because we don't because we don't reward people for making other people's lives easier. Researchers who publish their findings, you mean? Sort of every, like everybody. In, in, in all situations, if we, if we are rewarding for novelty and if we're rewarding for being different and better in a competitive space, then we will always build systems that, that are biased towards the individuals who have lots of power. Mm. And so one of the things that I think is a really nice sort of exciting opportunity about being here at the Turing Institute is because we so we are we're one third funded by universities we're one third funded by industry partners and then we're one third funded by government and actually in the same sort of way that you're talking about with NHSX one of the roles of the National Institute is to bring people together to try and facilitate conversations and I think I think that we will do better and more interesting research if a bunch of people with different types of expertise all come together and they figure out how they can share that expertise. It would be great to have some actual research to document that. I know there's research showing that uh, boards of companies that have more diversity in them lead to more successful companies. Um, but how fun to... Uh, your hypothesis makes total sense and certainly fits my experience, but I'm, I'm just one person. So it would be wonderful to have something external and authoritative to point to to say, yeah, absolutely, there's no reason not to do this. I think the, I think the goal, so the Turing on the website and, and in the various talks that we have, the, we have these big challenges. And one of them, in fact, is revolutionize healthcare. Mm. And I suppose one of the things that's quite difficult in statistics is to prove a null. So there is no research to show that we have successfully collaborated because I think we have not yet, as a research community, successfully collaborated. And this is one of the opportunities where we would be able to potentially bring it together. I've got like three aggressive nods. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I think we should probably... Quite peaceful nods, to be honest. <laughs> they, got, they got a bit more. They, they came more, like closer to my eye line. <laughs> Um, so we will ask, let you all yeah. talk. I'm really sorry to interrupt, but we now have the second half where it's open to you guys for what you want to say. And um, the person who's put their hand up first is very lucky because they just get to be handed the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the throwing mic and everyone else, the poor suckers, have to catch it. Um, so first question over here from Lucy. Thank you. Um, I'm Lucy Wills. I'm, I'm moving from design into healthcare and I'm trying to make healthcare as inclusive as possible. Um, and I'm finding that it's the technology is there, the will is there. What, what we're coming up against are inherent biases that have been in the NHS for a very, very long time. And um, the particular area I'm working in is in the overlap between rare disorders and learning differences and learning disabilities. And what I'm finding is that the data isn't there to prove that the services are missing. So I'm trying to address that. But the question I have... Um, for both of you, is how can we get from the st from the st from we're trying to get to the pl place where we've got uh, you know genomic medicine, personalised medicine, and we're using data really intensively. How do we get there if we don't know the data that we need to get there? How can we make the NHS more condition agnostic, for example? How can we look at symptoms rather than silos of conditions or particular organs? Yeah. Thank you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to go? Sure. So I have two 
possible two ways that we're thinking about it, but I think there are probably plenty more that uh, we should all explore. Um, so one of which is obviously, uh, especially when you get into genomics, there's a lot that we don't know we can find. So inevitably, there are loads and loads of patterns in there that we haven't yet made sense of, um, all the more so when you then work in clinical data and environmental data and whatever else. Um, so some of it, we need to be clever enough in how we pose our research questions and what area we're exploring, which also feeds into all the incentives you've talked about, um, to, to try to find what's missing, to try to surface what's missing, which is way easier said than done. I recognize that. Um, the other is that we're starting to think from NHSX's perspective that um, we're talking a lot about what's the role of the center and what's the role of uh, an individual organization. So it's relatively clear when you look at technology that the role of the center would be to be the place where everyone agrees that this is a, a blood pressure has five attributes or two attributes or whatever, um, but the center is not going to say, therefore, you have to use this system. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But when you look at things from a, not a, a, a speaking as a software engineer, sorry, I'm going to go software here for a second, but when you look at not from a back-end perspective, which is the, the data model stuff, mm -hmm. but from a front-end and UX perspective, not just digital services, but the UX of the entire NHS, we have never, as far as I'm aware, said that uh, as a patient who has multiple conditions in different specialties and sees a GP, the NHS should be one singular, singular user journey for you. Instead, we've basically said, here's the complexity of the system, figure it out yourself, right? Which is then not only extraordinarily complicated and a big burden, but also probably correlates to some bad uh, health outcomes. I don't know if we have that data yet either, but it'd be great if we did. Um, so we're wrestling with what are the user journeys that we can boil things down to that aren't you are a cancer patient and you are a diabetes patient, but you have a long-term condition that's well managed. You have a long-term condition that's not well managed. You are generally healthy, but something acute has gone wrong. And if we can get those archetypal user journeys to something that's reasonably robust, what do we do with them such that it then starts making sense of uh, the way that I as a patient would interact with this hospital and this GP surgery? Um, so very early days of starting to think about it, but it definitely crosses into what I think you're talking about. I have, um, I have just one thing to sort of add on that, which is that when the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, version 5 was released, I think, four years ago, I'm not going to remember that exactly, mm. um, it's like the handbook that kind of psychiatrists and clinical psychologists use to diagnose and sort of categorize you if you have any uh, mental health disorders <coughs> into particular bins. And probably a lot of people know will a lot of people will know that autism became autism spectrum disorder, and there was this sort of appreciation that people have quite varying sort of levels along multiple dimensions, all of which can be categorized into autism spectrum, but really should be treated on a reasonably individual basis. One of the things that I think is really, really important that people know is that all of research suggested that every one of the mental health disorders should have been treated as dimensional, mm -hmm. should have been treated as spectra along various different um, aspects. But it became more complicated. The um, insurance systems in the US had no interest in making things that complicated because that would, how would you sort of, how it would is. you bill, bill people depending on what group that they were in? Um, interestingly as well, I think the, the people who have the labels of particular mental health disorders often also didn't want to go into a spectrum one. There's something about kind of finding a community of people who are similar to you. And I think unless you have the language to be able to talk about dimensions, the, the personalized aspect can also feel very isolating. And I just want to sort of use that as an example of the fact that so people will tend to get whichever label causes them to come into, um, into the healthcare system for the first time. So people with bipolar disorder are very often misdiagnosed as depressed because it's unusual but not impossible that people would come in when they were having a manic experience. When you're having a manic experience, feel quite excited, everything's going well, your family are probably a bit worried about you. 
but you may not make it into the health service. You may come in as, a, um, as someone who's depressed. And I think that one of the dreams would be to have not just the human language, which I think quite a lot of um, psychiatrists and doctors do have, but actually the machine language mm -hmm. to, to capture the complexity of each individual person. And that's where, if you're going to build the standard, I think what I love so much about the sort of failure of 15 years ago is that it was just sort of designed cold and then dumped out on the clinicians. And so really these have to come with engagements from the patients, engagements with um, technologists, and engagements with the doctors. Definitely. And that's going to be the only way that you're going to come up with language, machine-readable language, that's going to actually make a positive difference. Could I make one further comment? That um, I think it would all, I absolutely agree with what you're saying, but I think it would be brilliant if that manual or future manuals also talked about the functional benefits of those conditions and how they can be supported. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's not just here's the disease part, this yeah. is terrible, we're so sorry, yeah. but these are also the, uh, the benefits that um, somebody who has this condition will be better at these things than somebody else. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. No, I'm not taking your catch box. <laughs> um, have we got any more questions? Uh, so there's a question at the front here. Ready? Yeah, you Heads can see. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. I would not put you in my netball team. Sorry. I know. Thank goodness it hit you, Yasin. So, yeah. English are meant to be good at cricket, aren't they? Yeah, I'm taking a moment just to think. I'm very rubbish at cricket. But uh, uh, my name is Matthew Trimming. I have a portfolio of things which I won't bore you with, other than to say that we invest in some early stage startup um, technology businesses, um, some of which Hadley's uh, had a look at, and do some advisory work for large and small organisations. The government, cognizant, um, would be two large ones and some smaller ones. I uh, just wanted to sort of pick up on. Um, one thing on genomics, by the way, to get from 100,000 to 5 million, the technology is obviously there. But you do have to incentivize people to sign up. And personally, I feel the NHS is currently putting too many barriers in the way of people sharing their genome, whether that is, you know, level of health or the ability to pay or those things. So that's just an aside, which I think is worth Matt having a think about. Um, just on standards, I'd love to hear a bit more from both of you on, you know, what standards you want to uh, encourage, promote, mandate, maybe, or provide guidance around to really see this interoperability start to uh, work and have all those. I think Matt Gould talks it talks about it as you know, standardised flowers, doesn't he? Sort of spreading across the NHS. So some thoughts on that would be welcome. Okay. Um, first on the genome thing, uh, thank you for the, the feedback. I'll definitely take it back uh, to our genomics colleagues. Um, it's been really interesting to watch that process. It's another example, um, we, we've talked quite a bit in the, the research context about the impact of the web changing a lot of underlying assumptions um, in, in research and in publication. And it's also happening in the context of clinical data. Um, and the, the NHS, particularly the sort of more scientific parts of the NHS, are going through this transformation of um, starting from historically, I have data about um, 10,000 patients who have this condition, and I'm really the only one who has this information because nobody else really needs it. It doesn't really matter to anyone apart from me. Um, depending on what it is. Uh, first for, um, uh, what do you call them, clinical trials, um, all the way to the digital economy version of I control all my data, GDPR says that I have the right to see everything about me and the right to a copy of it and the right to then do my own research or manipulate it or whatever it is that I want to do. Um, and that has been interesting in the clinical research area. It's been interesting in the direct care area. And it's now also interesting in the genomics area, um, where not only are we wrestling with the, the cultural change of, um, yes, we're moving towards patients having access to everything on their own, but also we're in a place where 
there's potentially a lot in the genome data, as we were talking about a second ago, that uh, that may tell me a lot about myself that I don't, that we collectively don't know yet. And so it may be that three years down the line, somebody discovers that this particular gene is going to tell me that I'm going to die in three weeks, and I'm the one who gets to find out looking at my genome, and I have no support. What does that mean? What do we do about that? How does that change the role of the health service and, and a genetic counselor who doesn't isn't necessarily anymore the the bearer of the news and the counseling. Um, so these are big questions for us as medicine that are weirdly being driven initially by the technology, but then depend much more on the, the people. Um, you asked about standards. The, the most important thing about, so we do have the, the power to mandate standards at the point of purchase across the NHS. Um, the most important thing to think about in what those standards are is that every part of NHS technology needs to participate in a data layer. Sort of like how, yes, I can have a laptop, but if my laptop doesn't connect to the internet, then it's really not that useful and it doesn't help me do my job communicating with my colleagues and, and everything else, finding out what's going on. Um, so those are the standards that are the most important, and we, we know some of the basics. We know, for example, that SNOMED is the um, uh, code list that we want to be using. So it's also the one that has the most take up thus far. Um, we know that uh, Fire APIs are the easiest and the most mature for us to be using as a, an interchange format. We also know that to do the kind of research that we talked about and the kind of um, uh, designing of interfaces for all kinds of different users, it's going to make a lot of sense for us to get down into the level, level of the data model and to then be, be able to say, for example, that we, we've decided we want blood pressures to just have a systolic and a diastolic, or no, we've decided we want blood pressure to have a systolic, a diastolic, and the size of the cuff, and whether I'm sitting down or lying down or standing up, um, and what, which part of my body you've taken that blood pressure on. Um, that's a, a, the sort of standard that uh, there are some existing models like that that we could use, but we, the NHS, with all of the suppliers, we need to decide what we need for, the, for, for the, this country, for how we uh, manage that kind of information. And that's the kind of work that we're going to have to do collectively, where it doesn't make sense to just say from the center, yeah, that looks about right, we'll choose that, uh, because we could so easily have so much collateral damage where that doesn't make sense on the ground. Good work. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, we all know that machine learning and AI, it, it tends to work best when the training data looks like the test data. Um, but it's quite possible that your test data has no diversity in it at all. Do you think we could see a situation in the future where we see standards being imposed um, around that diversity? Um, uh, and how on earth would that look if we did? Interesting. That's one that's not come uh, up. Oh, sorry. Oh, wait, are you going to do two questions? Two questions. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Woo! Get the row. You can be on my netball team. <laughs> um, so on the um, vision of kind of true collaboration in our capitalist society, what advice would you give to kind of jobbing um, software engineers or data scientists working full time in health tech on the industry side? Yeah. So do you do the, yeah. Yeah. So I... I've never had a job in industry, so I feel like I'm probably not I I'm probably not the best person to give um, advice on it. But from the sort of vision of um, aiming for collaboration, I think trying to break down the um, the sort of stereotype and um, mystique of the the brilliant programmer. I feel like that if we could that that echoes in lots and lots of different aspects, but specifically in software engineering, there is a sort of um, idea that if you're an asshole who sits by themselves and like doesn't take advice from anyone else, that that is the only way to be this brilliant artist. It's like we were talking before we came um, into Enigma about how we teach science and technology fields in school as being very cold, as being very sort of methodical of going from A to B to C, and someone has already known the answer, so now you've got the same answer and you can give yourself a little checkbox and smiley face and that's fine. And actually, once you, go, once you hit the level of what people know, 
Now you're in this much more creative space. Now you're in a space where actually you don't know what the answer is and you've no idea what the correct path forwards is. And we have tended to revere individual brilliance. Um, and we've often tended to sort of forgive the, the individual assholery um, that sometimes, not always, comes along with individual brilliance. And so I think um, the teams that will do the best software development work will be teams that listen to each other and make it easy for others to do well. And I just sort of feel like that's advice that goes way beyond <laughs> working as a software engineer in health tech. But I do think that if the goal is to deliver something on time that works for others, then being, then focusing on the microcosm of making your code easy for other people to read, making sure that it's commented, making sure that you are helping others along the way. I have a friend who left the Turing when she finished her PhD and she now works as a industry data science, not in health tech. Um, and the, the aggression in, co in, p in code review, she was not really prepared for. This sort of showing off kind of aspect of, I can make your code more difficult to read, but technically more, more sort of impressive. And I think anything that we can do to try and push, up, push back against that would be, really, would be really good. Oh, that's so true. Yeah. The number of people who think that code being harder to read is a good thing is yeah. just no, oh, comments are there for a reason. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. But the other thing I'd add to that is that uh, I, I completely agree with everything you said, particularly around team dynamics and um, letting individual egos get out of control, uh, whether they're our own or, or not. Um, but given, or and, given the amount of data that we know we have across the NHS and across healthcare, uh, we we know that there are loads of unsolved, not just unsolved problems, but unnoticed opportunities. There's all kinds of really basic correlations that could be phenomenally impactful. Um, so Ben Goldacre is the chair of um, Matt's Tech Advisory Board, and Ben works on, has built Open Prescribing, which is a beautiful site, very well done and very well targeted, but is, is literally just looking at, for this GP surgery, what are your trends in the top 10 Prescribing, drug, prescribing the top 10 drugs that matter for safety or cost or whatever, and then how do you benchmark against other, other surgeries, which is in and of itself very powerful. Um, ben wants to do the same on uh, secondary care on hospital prescribing data. We haven't yet made that available. It's one of the things from NHSX's perspective we're working on. But there are loads and loads of opportunity. Oh, the reason I brought up Ben is because I can't remember the exact number, but he cites uh, tens of millions of pounds in savings just from exposing um, for example, that NICE has not has re recommend, switched the recommendation for a particular antibiotic for a particular kind of infection from this one to this one, and um, helping the laggards realize that they haven't switched yet is just phenomenally uh, impactful. Um, there are countless examples like that where really basic analysis of data that's just kind of floating around will make a massive difference in the health service, um, and there just aren't enough people doing analysis type jobs to do them. So by all means, be creative, be exploratory, and don't expect that because this seems obvious to you, somebody else might have or must have already done it and decided that it's not worth doing. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, Before we wrap up, can we answer the diversity in the data set question? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. So, so I, I give a lot of talks about reproducibility. So I like I just want people to be able to like, like I said earlier, if they've written down a result in their academic paper, I just want to be able to like have somebody. It doesn't even have to be me if you can't share the data. Like, I just want somebody else to be able to check that. And for me, one of the things that I emphasize is that that is like the lowest of all of the low bars, right? It doesn't mean that the analysis that they were doing was right. It doesn't mean that um, they are successfully answering the scientific question that they're interested in. It doesn't mean that that pathway to impact is correct. Um, it also doesn't mean that you'd find it again in a different data set or anything like that. But I think it's, the, it's a necessary step in order to get all the way up to actually doing good science and good medical research. And so my response to this, this question is, yes, I can definitely imagine a world in which you are much, much more transparent about the characteristics of the training data set, exactly what's happening with the model that you have trained, you've learned something from that training data set, 
and exactly how it's going to be applied. And I think that there's super interesting stuff that would be even again before, below, much further down, much earlier than what you're suggesting, where you just do it with multiple random seeds and show how variable your different results are. And I think for me, my answer is yes, I think you could definitely get there. But I think we have to incentivize transparency about the characteristics of the data before we get there. And that is not hard to do. You could easily write down the characteristics of the data. You just have to incentivize doing it. Did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'll second that. So much of it, from my perspective, comes down to transparency. Yeah. Um, I'm not yet sure. Obviously, the way we think about AI and machine learning is changing so dramatically and constantly. I'm not yet clear on where the opportunities are for standardization in a way that won't then screw up people doing new and interesting things. Um, so I wouldn't say that, yes, absolutely, we need very clear standards on, or technical standards on, uh, the way you express your training data versus your, um, your testing data. Um, but I definitely see the problem that you're identifying, and I think that the solution for it is, is absolutely transparency, especially when you're um, setting up something like a, an experiment or a study that is then relatively self-contained. It gets much more complicated when you've got something that is in clinical use and is continually iterating as you go, um, where the bias might have come from the training data, but then it really depends on whose patient's data or what scans it's seen and, and where it goes from there. There's a lot of regulatory issues there that we're exploring, but I think we, we society, we all of us in this room, need to keep looking at them and making sure that what we are using and building and relying on is actually useful and helpful rather than running off in a, a direction that's not so. Perfect. So I'm afraid we have to wrap up because you all, um, I promised to all your employees you're going back to work at two. Um, so can we have a huge round of applause for Kirsty and Hadley? Yeah.